It's 1789 in Paris, and the French Revolution is getting... Uh, hairy. Do you remember your situation in the last episode? Oh, we need the end. Yeah, I bet you thought you died, but you didn't. Wait, look over there! Good job. Turns out you escaped and ran into the forest. You thought no one would find you. Until they found you. Hey! Oh, hey. Nice hat. Mm. So, you want to join my army? Hmm? Mm. Turns out this little man goes by the name Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte. But what the heck is he doing in this story? We'll find out. In the last episode of the French Revolution, we left off with chaos in the streets, an emerging civil war of ideas, and King Louis XVI losing more and more power to the people. In this chaos, we saw the birth of the political right and left, and their battle for supremacy. But who would win? What would happen to King Louis? And would France get the utopia it was trying to achieve? And what the heck does the little guy with the hat have to do with any of this? Today, we find out. Hey, I'm Daniel Myers. And I'm Lim. And this is TBH History. It's 1789, and France is in the full heat of revolution with hunger and violence and fire and screaming and heads on pikes in Paris. You know, the usual stuff. In the midst of the chaos, the National Assembly, representing the people of France, is meeting to try to fix, like, all the things and try to pass forward. The National Assembly was split down the middle between the political right and left, and they squabbled quite a lot. However, in August of 1789, the assembly issued a document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. In some ways, it resembled America's Declaration of Independence, and they even got the help of Thomas Jefferson to write it. This new declaration was a big win for the people, but there were still many questions to answer. The National Assembly continued debating the future of France while King Louis XVI remained in Paris and told the National Assembly that he would support all their Decisions. And you get a support, and you get a support. You all get supports. He was acting cool. Nothing at all wrong in the world. Mmm, no. In reality, he was actually freaking out. <laughs> at this point, he knew he had lost control, so, you know, he might as well act supportive so he doesn't, uh, you know, get the axe and kill and all that, you know. <laughs> the people of France were ready to move on from having a king rule over them. And Louis XVI knew it. So King Louis implemented a brilliant strategy. A strategy of get the heck out of there. On June 21st, 1791, he hid his family in a carriage and tried to escape the country. And it worked. Uh, except for when it didn't. He was recognized in the town of Varennes on his way out and sent back to Paris with his tail between his legs. Hey, aren't you uh, King Louis? To make matters worse, Louis XVI's escape attempt dealt the right side of the political aisle a tough blow. For two years, they had been arguing for a partnership with Louis XVI, but now he was caught trying to bail on them. And just like that, he ticked off his greatest ally. All in a day's work. But Louis XVI did have a backup plan to regain power. Not long after holding back punishment on his rebellious subjects, Louis had the Baron de Breteu send out messages to his royal neighbors, including the monarchs of Spain, Austria, and Prussia, to come help him from his revolutionary madness. Let me say that again. He tried to convince other countries outside of France to help him by saying similar uprisings would soon be coming their way. And just how exactly did he want them to help? By declaring war on his own country. The king hoped a war would cause the people of France to turn back to his leadership. As crazy as it was, step one of his plan actually worked. There was a war, and there's a good chance his efforts helped start it. Oh, look, a war. How terrible. But step two of his plan, not so good. Sure is nice to have a king in times like these, mm -hmm. am I right? Well, um... <laughs> the French military fought like mad and resisted outside attacks without King Louis XVI's help. Jacques! <laughs> and the French also happened to have a little guy named General Napoleon who was fighting like mad too. Aha! Turns out France didn't really need their king after all. So Louis XVI's whole start a war and the people will want me back plan was more like a start a war and the people will still won't want me back, but I'll be responsible for a lot of needless death and suffering plan. Seems to be a recurring theme with this guy. It's for a good cause. Hmm. It's proven once again that King Louis XVI will go to any length to improve his own image or maintain power, even if it means war for his own people. At this point he was out of options and the people were like, madder than ever. <laughs> Radical members of the left pounced, claiming Louis was an enemy of the revolution, and that appropriate violence towards him would be justified. Leading Jacobins, a radical group in the left, like lawyer Maximilien Robespierre, 
called for the king to be executed. And the people were like, yeah, go ahead and kill him. Chop off his head yeah. till he is dead. Yeah. The fate of Louis XVI would be put to a vote. If the right wins, he lives. And if the left wins... By a vote of 361 to 360, Louis XVI was sentenced to death for the crime of conspiracy against public liberty. And on January 21st, 1793, at the age of 38, the King of France was publicly executed by his own people. By the slimmest of margins, the civil war of ideas was over. Now that the king was dead, the right side of the assembly lost its leverage, and the left took control. For years, they had been telling the poor people of Paris that their enemy was not just the king, but also the conservatives on the right, the industrial bourgeoisie and moderate nobles who promoted compromise and deal-making with the king. Jacobins hated compromise and had an all-or-nothing mindset. They had taken control of power and were now in position to demand everyone bow to their wishes. You know, which is good when you're ordering donuts, but when you are trying to run a country, that's no, no good. You cannot have all the donuts. Using various levels of intimidation, conservative supporters of the revolution were quickly thrown out of the political scene, and no new conservatives emerged to fill the open space. And just like that, the left had completely beaten the right. A committee for public safety was created by the Jacobins to stop anyone they thought stood in the way of the revolution. Safety, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that conservatives were out of the picture and the left had full control, you would think that they'd be celebrating and patting each other on the back and, you know, all that stuff. But instead, they created another new political divide for themselves. France's economic scene was still a mess, and leading Jacobins began making pleas for the government to control the economy by regulating prices of goods and wages for workers. Why, what do you think you do? A large ally of the Jacobins, named the Girondins, have been cool with getting rid of the king, but they didn't really like the idea of the economy being run by the government and all that kind of stuff. So Girondin objections upset Jacobin leaders, and now all of a sudden, there was a new right developing in the left. The Girondins were like, What's happened? I thought we were on the same team. Remember, we hated the monarchy. And the Jacobins were like, Bro, you're either all the way or you're in the way. And if you're in the way, then we jump and we pounce, pounce, pounce. The Girondins were violently purged by a wave of murder and executions handled primarily by the Committee for Public Safety. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good job, Public Safety Committee. Wow, killing people doesn't seem safe to me. And this kicked off a cycle of the left eating itself called the Reign of Terror. 17,000 people were executed from September 1793 to July 1794. That's a lot of heads rolling. I'll tell you what, a lot of heads. The left couldn't really get along with anyone, not even themselves. Anyone who wasn't radical enough was considered an enemy of the revolution, and enemies of the revolution must be dealt with. Like that kind of dealing with where you don't come back. Eventually, the Jacobins split over political differences, and even Robespierre was eventually considered an enemy. And in July of 1794, he got the chop. No, no, I love the revolution. The revolution is my friend. As you can see, things got totally ridiculous. Outside of Paris, communities began rejecting the ways of the revolution well before Louis XVI was executed. And through the terror, more and more Frenchmen just wanted things to go back to the way they were. They had enough of the chaos and wanted order again. This created an opening for a scrappy young general from Corsica to rise to power and crown himself emperor in 1804. Yes, it's the little man you found in the forest, Napoleon Bonaparte. Turns out he did have a plan and it worked. So even though France got rid of their king, they ended up with an emperor. Basically just like the same thing as before, just a different title, you know? So why was France's revolution so bloody with so little change, especially when compared to America's revolution? Let's zoom out and take a look. Although many people compare the French Revolution to America's, there were important differences. In fact, the French and American revolutions had very different goals. The Jacobins on the political left, who ultimately took control of the French Revolution, wanted a utopian society, meaning that they believed they could reach perfection and rid society of all evil. But in this attempt to create a heavenly utopia, they created a hell on earth by punishing or killing anyone who didn't conform to their own idea of perfection. Trying to force society to fit a particular idea of utopia always leads to violating people's freedoms and shunning large people groups. Why? Because in order to reach perfection, anyone outside of the idea of perfection must be forced to conform or be eliminated. The founders of America, on the other hand, 
realize that utopia isn't attainable and the differences and imperfections of people must be accounted for. Rather than enforcing a particular vision of utopia, they sought to create something more realistic, a more free and just society that allowed for people to have their own ideas and live their own lives without being forced to conform to a strict utopian vision. So here we are at the end of the French Revolution, or at least the first French Revolution of many more in France's uh, future to come, so that's, that's good. So let's review the key moments and answer the questions that we set out with today. The battle between the political left and right ended with the left winning. In the name of equality and fairness, the left went on to execute King Louis XVI and anyone they deemed an enemy of the revolution. The executions went on for years because the left couldn't stop dividing and killing each other, this being known as the Reign of Terror. Neighboring countries didn't want what was happening in France to happen to them, so they invaded, throwing France into full-blown war. Led by General Napoleon, France fought off their enemies, and Napoleon became so powerful and popular that he seized control and made himself emperor. And there you have the French Revolution. So let's end with a thought-provoking question. Is it possible to have a utopian society? If yes, why? If no, why? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of TBH History for PragerU. Please make sure you like this video, subscribe so you can see more to come and share it with your friends. But if you're still watching, post a boomerang emoji in the comments below. And to sweeten the deal, if you want a shout out in our next episode, be the first one to post a boomerang emoji and tell us why we want you to post it. We'll give you a shout out in the next episode. But until then, it's time for our shout out from last episode. Who's it gonna be? All right, now it's time for the shout out. Research, wow, what have we here? Daniel Charlin. Tennis ball, because the revolution began with the oath of the tennis court, a vow taken by the third estate inside a tennis, indoor, an indoor tennis court that formed the National Assembly. Daniel Charland, you win the shout out. You gotta clap for him, clap for Daniel. You in the audience, clap for him. All right, good job. Uh, every time like, he does it a little different, just roll with it. Oh! 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 <laughs> Safety, bro. Yes, yeah, safety. Go <laughs> away, his wing. Hey, kill him. Hey, kill him. Hey, kill him, my gosh. Hey, hey, kill him, man. That's it. <laughs> bro, you just killed the movie. <laughs> <laughs>